Good morning, Woodside family. We're so glad you're joining us. We are one church with 14 locations across Southeast Michigan. If you're looking to get connected in a Christ-centered community, we'd love to get you plugged in. If you have questions, feel free to drop them in the comment section or check out our website. We're excited to get to know you. Service will begin shortly, but first take a moment, hit that share button and invite someone to join you for church this morning. Again, we're so happy you're here. In the house of the Lord this morning, amen. We're gonna dive right into the word of God in, in just a moment. I do wanna start by saying thank you to a very special group of people. Yesterday we wrapped up another season of Upward Basketball. And uh, praise God for that. When is basketball more than basketball? When, the answer is when it's Upward Basketball. Upward Basketball really is a ministry of our church. And this year we had just under 400 kids that came and participated, 70% of which were not Woodside kids. They were outside of uh, Woodside. Amen. And I want to say thanks to John Everhart, to his entire team. Uh, John does such a marvelous job. Carol Rothenberger as well, thank you so much. Also, Caleb Wheatley, they do such a marvelous job in administering this. Uh, it's fun, kids are learning basketball skills, but even more importantly, they're hearing about Jesus every week in practice and at games, and, and uh, I pray that we'll continue to see that ministry flourish and, uh, and welcome families. And if your family here is a result of uh, being a part of Upward, we just want you to know you're welcome. And we are so glad you are here. Well, today is a special day. It is um, a week away from the start of Holy Week, but it's also a special day because it's St. Patrick's Day. Now, um, I see a lot of people wearing green, and as a Spartan, I always like that. Whenever people wear, wear green, but when I say St. Patrick's Day, what comes to mind for you? I Googled this, what, what things are associated with St. Patrick's Day, and I saw things like uh, corned beef and cabbage. Maybe you got that on the menu today. Or uh, leprechauns, I hope you don't see any of those. <laughs> green beer, shamrocks, clover leaves. Now, if this is all you know about St. Patrick, I want to introduce you to what I consider to be one of the great heroes of the faith. St. Patrick is um, uh, someone that I admire immensely. St. Patrick is most closely associated with Ireland, but the irony of that is that he was not born in Ireland. Rather, he was born in 387 A.D. in Britain, Scotland to be specific, which was a warring nation of Ireland. He was born to a wealthy family, and although his father was a deacon, Patrick was not a Christ follower. As a matter of fact, he uh, had rejected the faith of his parents as a young man. But at the age of 16, Irish raiders came to his little village and they kidnapped him and they took him to Ireland and, uh, and, and made him a slave. And for six years, Patrick was a slave. He served as a herdsman and uh, he was in a very lonely and desolate hill country part of, of Ireland. But it was in this lonely and bleak season of these six years that he had much time to reflect upon his life, upon his choices, even upon his own sin and need of salvation and redemption. And it was when, uh, it was during this time rather, that uh, Patrick gave his heart to the Lord and began to grow in his affection for Jesus. After six years, Patrick and a few other slaves had devised a plan of escape, and lo and behold, it worked, and he was able to, to escape Ireland, get back to his native Britain, to his home country, his home village, and be restored back to his family. His mother and his father were overjoyed, not just to have their son back, but they were overjoyed about Patrick's uh, newfound faith and his love for Jesus. Patrick was so uh, fervent for Jesus that he decided that he wanted to go into ministry, full-time ministry, and he wanted to dedicate his life to studying the Bible 
And so he began to do that as a young man studying the scriptures and went to the equivalent of what we would call Bible college or Bible school. While he was there preparing for ministry, thinking he would do that in his hometown and in his home country of Scotland, one day he felt the Lord speaking to his heart in prayer. Here's what he, he sensed the Lord saying to him, that, Patrick, you are my voice to the Irish people, and you are to walk among them again. Think about that for a moment. Think about God calling you after escaping slavery to go back to the very people and the very place in which you were captive. But Patrick, so dedicated fully to the Lord, went back. He did just that. He went back. At that time, Ireland was not only a pagan nation, but it's a stretch to really even call it a nation because it wasn't really united at that time, but rather it was a collection of hundreds of tribes. It was a very tribal nation at that time, and many of those tribes were uh, fighting against one another. But before it was all said and done, God used Patrick to declare the gospel, and he was a very effective church planner. He planted over 300 churches, one, at least one, in every tribe in Ireland, helping to unite them on the basis of their faith in Jesus Christ. Before it was all said and done, St. Patrick is estimated to have baptized over 100,000 men and women through the ministries that he started, the churches that he started. How many think that that's pretty awesome? And he, he died, he died being referred to as the Apostle to Ireland. The Apostle to Ireland. What a powerful story. And what it demonstrates to me is how God uses one man, one person's repentance to start revival. That this one man turned to the Lord, and at the time when he turned to the Lord, I'm sure, no doubt, he did not think that that was going to lead to some national revival, but his personal renewal led to community and even national revival. I bring that up today, not just because it is St. Patrick Day, and I want you to know why he is so venerated, why is he so highly regarded, but I bring it up because it is the story of King David as well. We've been studying Psalm 51, and I want to invite you there to join me once again this week. And in Psalm 51, we've been looking at a psalm of repentance by uh, Israel's most famous king, King David. And we've journeyed through the majority of the psalm. Today we get a chance to close out in the last two verses, verses 18 and 19. And what we're going to see in David's prayer is this shift. So far, David has been focused in on his own personal sin. Let me remind you that this psalm comes after a season of sin in David's life. Every one of us will know seasons of sin. Every one of us will know moments where we will get out of step with the Spirit of God, where we will not behave according to Christian character, where we will fall short, miss the mark. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So let me make a PSA, a public service announcement. This is not the assembly of the perfect. If you're looking for that class, it's down the hall. But this is the assembly of those who know that we are broken, those who know that there are none that are righteous, no, not one, those who know that the only thing that separates us from those that don't know Christ is the mercy we have received in Christ. But David's life, much like St. Patrick's life, is a demonstration of how one person's renewal can lead to community Revival. I want to read in Psalm um, 51 in just a moment, but before I do, I want you to hear this quote from a great revivalist. How many have ever heard the name Charles Finney before? Anybody ever heard that name before? A few of you have heard the name Charles Finney. Charles Finney was Billy Graham before Billy Graham. He was a great preacher of the gospel and 
He was a revivalist is what he was known as. He preached during the 1800s. He also became the president of Oberlin College in Oberlin, Ohio. And before he died, he did a series of lectures, lectures on revival to his students. Those lectures were compiled into a book first published in 1835 under the title Lectures on Revivals, or on Revival to My Students. And um, here's what he says that revival is. Here are these words. Revival is a renewed conviction of sin and repentance, followed by an intense desire to live in obedience to God. That's what revival is. It is when you and I, on a deeply personal level, begin to feel a renewed conviction over sin. Now, everything in our world wants to desensitize us to our sins. Everything in our world wants to make sin so casual, so normalized, that we no longer feel any conviction about it. One of the reasons why God rebukes Israel in the Old Testament is because, according to him, they forgot how to blush. They no longer felt shame anymore. There was no more embarrassment when they behaved the wrong way, said the wrong things, when their eyes saw or looked upon the wrong things, when they listened to the wrong things. And we need to pray that we not become so callous that we too forget how to blush. Charles Finney says, revival happens when there is deep conviction over sin and an intense desire to live in obedience to God. When your Christian faith no longer becomes about the outer fringes of your life or just what you do on Sunday, but you reorient your life to the place where Christ is the centerpiece of your life. Is that true about you? Is that, is that true about your faith? Is Jesus the centerpiece of your life or living on the fringes? Charles Finney goes on to say this. He says, the revival is when one gives up one's own will to God in deep humility. He says, God will honor such humble repentance with his presence. And if the presence of God is in the church, the church will draw the world in. However, if the presence of God is not in the church, the world will draw the church out. Notice that he says that the power of our gatherings is in the presence of God. The power of our gatherings is not seen in smoke machines or lyrics on screens. It's not seen in the beauty of our buildings. It's certainly not seen in our programs or our strategies. Any of those things detached from the presence of God lacks any tangible power to change the human heart. But if you gather in this place, there becomes a weeping in your heart over your own sin. If by chance you should come and while songs are being sung and sermons are being preached, you're sensing God drawing you, know that it's not because of any of the externals. It's because the presence of God has been pleased to dwell among us. It is God's spirit that draws. And if the spirit of God is at work in his people, it will be evidenced by their personal repentance, but it won't stop with them. It will spread beyond them into community revival. This is exactly what David picks up on in verses 18 and 19. Let's look at these two verses. I'll pull out two points and then we'll pray. He says, do good to Zion, In your good pleasure, build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offering, and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. These are two verses that are easy to throw away. These are two verses that can even feel like they're so detached from the rest of the psalm. But I want you to know they are deeply in David's heart and mind attached to the psalm. Notice that in verse number 10 of this psalm, David is 
totally focus in on himself. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Notice that up until this point, his focus has been, Lord, it's me that's in the need of change. Forgive me, O Lord. Have mercy on me. But by the time we get to verse number 18, his prayer has changed. Do good to Zion, he prays. Well, who is Zion? Zion is not only a a name of endearment for the holy mountain of God, Mount Mount Horeb, where uh, uh, Moses goes up to meet with God and receives the Ten Commandments written with the finger of God on two tablets that he brings down to the nation of Israel so that they might know God's character and his heart and his will and his ways. But Zion is an affectionate name that the people of God became known for. That to, to, to refer to the people of God as, as Zion was, was to say that they were God's chosen people in covenant with God, that covenant that was signed by faith in trusting God when the Ten Commandments were given. So what David is really praying is, God, be good to your people. Lord, be good to your people. In other words, Lord, my prayer is that my sin would not hinder your goodness to your people. He goes on to say, pour out your pleasure upon your people and demonstrate that by building up the walls of Jerusalem. Now these were not so much, uh, this was not so much him praying for the physical walls of Jerusalem to be uh, built. We, would, we, we have no historical reason to believe that that was what he was praying, but rather the walls represented something. The walls around Jerusalem represented protection for Jerusalem. It represented peace for Jerusalem. It represented uh, prosperity for Jerusalem. And so what what David is praying is that, Lord, my prayer is that you would bless Jerusalem, which is the city at the heart of the nation, bless Zion, bless your people, bless this nation with your peace, with your protection, with your pleasure, with your presence. Now, why would he have to pray this? It's because as its king his sin would have had a profound effect beyond just his life. It would have affected the people. Notice that throughout this entire study of Psalm 51, I've been trying to reinforce this thought in your heart and in mine, reminding us that contrary to popular belief, there is no such thing as private sin. That one of the lies of our adversary and enemy is to cause us to think that what we're doing is just between me, myself, and I. And it's not hurting anybody. That you can lie and it's just between you and yourself. That you can be deceptive and nobody's going to get hurt by that. That it doesn't matter what you look at, what you lust upon. It doesn't matter if you break covenant with your spouse. It doesn't matter if you engage in in sinful activities. After all, who are you hurting? That's what he would have you to believe. But what David introduces here is something that is really, really powerful that I pray that you don't forget, and that is that when I sin in private, it affects in public. That when I sin in private, it affects the people around me. Now, here's the good news, though. That while there's no such thing as private sin, there is no such thing as private repentance either. That's a good place to say amen. That when we repent of our sins, it also has a profound effect beyond just us. That when I come before God and I humbly confess my sins before him, he who sees in private will bless publicly. This is how revival happens. One of my favorite books on on revival is written by a man named Elmer Towns. Now, you'll know by his first name, Elmer, that it's not a contemporary book. 
But Elmer Towns writes a book on the 10 greatest revivals, starting with the day of Pentecost and Peter's uh, powerful prayer that saves thousands, leading all the way up to Billy Graham. Maybe you know that there's been awakening after awakening in our land, and it's been a powerful thing to see seasons where God's spirit, Spirit has moved in special ways. And one of the things that Elmertown did is he studied these revivals to say, what has been the common denominator? And he breaks it down to two common denominators. And the two common denominators are repentance and prayer. That if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. This is what God promises Israel, but it is also a reflection of his character that when the people of God get right before God, when we humble ourselves before him, that the personal conviction of sin that we experience that leads us to repentance has a profound blessing upon the people around us. And this is what David realized, that as the political leader of Israel, if I get right with the Lord, then God will restore his pleasure to his people. The walls will stand strong. Zion will be blessed. Let me just say one of the things that should not be lost on us is that we're reading this in a political year. We're in a year in which we're going to be voting And I think that one thing we can all agree, no matter where you fall in your partisan affiliations, is that our our nation is in trouble. That there is a steep moral decline. That maybe the greatest evidence of the crises of our moment is the epidemic of despair that's seen among our children. Is this epidemic of despair that's seen among the youth in our nation. I praise God for those of you who work with, for those of you who work with children and youth, but my heart breaks because I recognize that they are not being raised in a highlight moment of our national history. They're they're being raised in an hour and an age of despair. And so how do we change that? For many of us, we've been convinced that the greatest way that we can affect change in our country is through our vote. And so we vote. And we hope that by electing our heroes, we can simultaneously defeat our foes. But yet, I think what David gives us is something more powerful than a vote. As important as it is for you and I to vote, I think what David says, even more important than your vote, is your voice. Is your voice lifted to God in repentance and in prayer? saying to the Lord, Lord, pour it out. Oh, God of revival, sin, revival, and let it start in me. David recognized that if there was going to be a change in Israel, it took more than just a change in political leaders, that it took a change in the heart of those political leaders, a change in the heart of God's people, that if his people were to humble themselves, that God then would restore his blessing and his favor. Friends, I tell you right now that If we are far from God, then all the public policy changes in the world won't be able to help a corrupt people, a a sinful people to be righteous again. No, it starts with his people humbling themselves before their God. But if we do, he promises he will heal our land. That he will restore his peace and his presence. And what our children need more than just success in November elections, what they need more than just ballot victories, what they need more than just political change is revival. Lord, sin revival, sin revival through our land. Let it sweep through our cities, our neighborhoods, our nation, and through a generation. That is what we need, Lord, is revival. 
And if we realize, if we ever come to the place where we truly in our heart of hearts accept that that's what we need and the generations that are following us, that that's what they need the most, it will profoundly change the way we approach our political adversaries. More than just wanting their defeat, we will want their salvation. We'll be praying for their repentance at the same mercy and grace of God that has been poured out upon us will be poured out upon them. Don't ever limit your power to affect this nation to simply a vote. As a believer, you have something far more powerful. You have the power of repentance. David repented and God restored his pleasure to Zion then verse number 19, we see this, that God restores his delight as well. Look at verse number 19. It says, then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. I know what you're thinking. Chris, how in the world does this apply? I haven't sacrificed a bull in I don't know how long. <laughs> Maybe you're thinking like, I can't relate to all of this burnt offering talk. And I get it because there is a separation of culture and separation of time and age. So let me help you to understand that what David is describing here is acts of normal worship practice among the people of God in his generation that it was a normal worship practice for them to come and as a demonstration of their worship of God, they would make sacrifices to him on behalf of their sins to say to him, Lord, we bring these sacrifices as a way of acknowledging your lordship, your rulership over our lives and acknowledging that we want to be right before you. Now, in this day and age, we bring a sacrifice of praise. We enter into his gates with thanksgiving. We enter into his courts with praise. We no longer bring the blood of bulls and rams. And how many thank God that you don't have to kill turtle doves to be right with God? But we, again, bring the sacrifice of praise. Now, I won't ask you, though I could, did you bring that sacrifice today? That would be a great message, a great sermon. Did we bring to him a sacrifice of praise that would be pre pleasing and acceptable for a king, a king of his stature? But rather, I will simply ask this question. When you brought it, was your heart in it? You see, what, what David helps us to see here is that it is possible for the people of God to offer him worship that he's not delighted in. Have you ever experienced this before? I've experienced this. Have you ever been driving before and you drive maybe on the freeway and you look up and you can't remember the last five minutes? Anybody ever experienced that? You ever been driving, especially when you've been driving for a long time, you got, you're, you're daydreaming, you're deep in thought, and you look up and say, I don't remember the last 10 miles. Has that ever happened to you in worship before? Have you ever just gone through the routine? I, I just will tell on myself. You don't have to tell on yourself. I'll just tell on myself that there have been times, not every time, but there are certain times when maybe the words on the screen are familiar words, and it's easy for me to just simply go through the motions, sing the songs, and I'm not even tuned in. And I know the difference. You see, God criticized Israel because with their words, they praised him, but with their hearts, they were far from him. What makes worship powerful is when your heart is aligned with your words. What makes worship pleasing to God is when out of the wellspring of deep appreciation and overflow of thanksgiving for the great mercy and grace he has shown us in Christ through the redemption and the salvation and the forgiveness of our sins, the renewing of our minds and our hearts, the fact that he has purchased and captured us and called us his own and restored relationship, what blesses God 
time is when out of the overflow of thanksgiving, we bring to him worship and praise. Then he looks upon our worship with delight. What David says is, Lord, look upon your worship, the worship of your people with delight and send revival to your people. Revive our gatherings, God. Revive our nation, O oh God. Let us see your spirit moving again. I mentioned that throughout the history of, the, of America, maybe you're aware of this. How many are aware that there have been four great awakenings in American history? How many have ever heard this before? An awakening is a revival. It is when there is a mass movement of people coming to Christ. Now, follow me. There have been times, four times, that historians will tell us that that there's, there's always salvation happening in individual or small ways, but there have been four times when it spread so broadly throughout our nation that even historians have had to take note that something different is happening here. Happened first at the dawn of our nation called the First Great, great Awakening. It, it's what led to the establishment of this country. And since then, there have been multiple ones. Most recently, most would argue that, that uh, the, the Billy Graham movement launched a fourth wave where there were people all across the country coming to faith in Jesus Christ. I would love to see that again. I would love to see that again. And the good news is, is that I, I believe, I am convinced for really good reason that we are standing on the verge of another great awakening. Now, now you may think that this is Chris Brooks uh, speaking hyperbolically. You may think that this is just me speaking with a sense of sensationalism because of the sermon, but, but I would push back on that because I believe God is moving in a special way in our generation. As a matter of fact, as I think about what God is doing among our college students, my heart is enlivened. Now, I know that if you listen to the report about young adults in this moment, you would be led to believe that none of them want God, that none of them are sensitive to the, uh, the things of God, and, and you would be uh, convinced that this is a bleak moment and hour, but don't believe the reports. Because I'm here to tell you that there's a different report about what's going on. Recently, I got a chance to talk to a good friend of mine. His name is York Moore. He lives locally, but he, for the last 30 years, have worked among university students broadly. And he said to me about two weeks ago, he says, Chris, I have seen more young people come to faith in Christ in this season of our ministry than what I've seen in over 30 years. <laughs> last week. Last week, I was with uh, the president of Moody Bible Institute, Mark Job, and he said the same thing. Chris, I'm seeing more college students come to faith in Jesus than what I've ever seen. And when you ask, where do we kind of mark this moment back to, for many people, they, was, they will say that this moment of this special move of God among university students started with a, a little Christian university in a town called Wilmore, Kentucky, called Asbury University. Maybe you've heard of this school before. How many have ever heard of Asbury University? Now, I have some personal ties there. I did, I did studies at Asbury University, and if you've ever gone to Wilmore, Kentucky, you know you've been there because it's only one road in. You, you don't drive through Wilmore, Kentucky. You either go there on purpose or you ain't going there at all. But in the middle of this town is Asbury University. And Asbury University last year experienced a revival, unexpected, unprecedented. You see, the story goes like this. It was February 8th. It was a normal Tuesday. They were having chapel. It wasn't a well-attended chapel. A few students showed up. Among the students who showed up was a young man, 22 years old. His name was Joshua Curry. He's a senior at Asbury University. 
Him, some of his friends, fellow students were there as a chaplain for the school, led a normal Tuesday chapel. It was a low-tech chapel. It didn't have words on screens. They sang some songs with lyrics on the paper. And then the chaplain preached a short message on love. Maybe there's something to be said about short messages, but I digress. <laughs> At the end of his short message on love, the chaplain closed in prayer, and he simply said, if you're in here and you feel God moving in your heart to repent of your sins, I invite you to join me at the altar as we close in prayer, much like I'm going to invite you in just a moment. The chaplain closed in prayer, and Joshua Curry walked to the altar because he sensed the Lord convicting him of his sins. As he stood there at the altar, confessing his sins, tears rolling down his eyes, unbeknownst to him, Students began to follow him. Word began to spread across the campus. Other students began to come. There was nothing special about the moment except for that God was moving in a special way. And as students began to come, there was no rush. They were just lingering in God's presence. What happened is that this Auditorium, Hughes Auditorium is what it's called. It probably holds about seven, eight hundred students, maybe a thousand if it's packed to capacity, begin to get more and more full. And what typically is a one hour chapel turned to 16 uninterrupted days of students praying, crying, confessing, repenting. Before it was all said and done, over 75,000 people over 16 days had come to the little town of Wilmore, Kentucky to be a part of what God was doing because the Lord was drawing them to repent of their sins. What began to happen, which surprised everyone, is that these students from other universities took what God was doing in their hearts back to their schools. Maybe you've heard the news. If you haven't, it'd be great for you to go and search this out as well. But since that time, there have been mass baptisms on the campus of Auburn University, Texas A&M University. And recently, this week, I read about mass baptisms on the campus of University of Alabama. God is moving in a special way among our college students. God is sending awakening and revival. But it's not because of slick marketing campaigns. It's not because of mega preachers and great gatherings and conferences. Think about how it started. It started with one young man, Joshua Curry, who felt the Lord convicting him of his sins, coming forward to pray. And I leave you with this question that's been burning in my heart since we started this study. It's a question I often ask myself. If God would do that with his repentance, what will God do with yours? You see, personal repentance always leads to public revival. And so maybe if today we repent, revival might touch your children. Maybe if today there is genuine repentance before the Lord, revival might touch your family or your neighborhood or the nation or generation. We don't control salvation, only he does. But we can posture our hearts and we can petition him for it. And so I invite you to stand as we close this study. And I'm gonna pray And we're going to worship one final song of worship, simple, humble song of worship. But while I pray, 
I want to open up our, our altar in front of our church for anyone who feels the Lord drawing you just to pray a special prayer of repentance and obedience to him, to just come and join me as you stand here together, us humbling our hearts and offering ourselves to the Lord. No pressure. If the Spirit of God is moving in your heart, I invite you to just come. Father, we acknowledge, Lord, that we need you. Lord, as I said earlier, we are not the assembly of the perfect. And our, our lives reflect our mistakes, maybe even our families, our marriages, our children have felt the consequences of it. But Lord, as we have sent you saying today that, that you're inviting us to come to you, all who are weary and heavy laden, and you will give us rest. But you are the God of revival. And when your people humble themselves before you, that you are faithful and just to forgive us, cleanse us of all unrighteousness, and that you will save. Lord, we need you. Our families need you. Our children need you. Our grandchildren need you. Our nation needs you. And so, Lord, we're not many in number in this place, but... Lord, if you should be so pleased, Lord, pour it out. Lord, I pray that you will receive our prayers of repentance. We pray that revival would start in us, but don't let it stop in us. Free us. Free our children from the lies of this culture. Free us from the deception of our enemy. Free us from addiction. Free us from, Lord, our, our lust of our hearts. Free us from the corruption that so often grips us, Lord. Set the captive free. Move by your spirit. Allow us to hear your voice again. Allow us to sense your presence again. Replace these hearts of stone with hearts of flesh. Do a work in us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name.